So in this video we're going to be talking about archaic Greece and what we find when we are able to rejoin the developments of the Greek story already in progress as they emerge from the Dark Age and become uh, audible and visible to us again. So, uh, just to recap, these are the periods of Greek history that we're involved with. Uh, we've already dealt with the Bronze Age and Lycenian period. Bronze Age uh, is succeeded by the Greek Dark Age. Uh, and uh, then the period that we're now dealing with, the Archaic period, the transition points being the period of calamities, the collapse of the Bronze Age around 1100, and uh, the thing that ends the Dark Age and makes it into the Archaic period, the recovery of writing somewhere in the middle of the 8th century. The Archaic period itself uh, comes to an end at the great turning point, the Persian invasions of 490 and 480. Um, this crystallizes the Greek community. Uh, they fight together against the Persians and, uh, sc and speeds them toward both the, um, the cultural ferment of the 5th century and the, uh, the wars that they fight with each other um, over the Greek idea itself. And so um, that's going to be the classical period, which we'll talk about later on. But uh, for now, the, what's important is that the Archaic period is the period in which um, the, uh, uh, what it is to be Greek and, and how Greek society functions it becomes uh, well established after the foundations had been laid during the Dark Age when we couldn't see them. The transition from the Dark Age, uh, as usual, is visible in the uh, surviving artwork most available to us. Pottery, pottery doesn't rot, and so therefore the decorations on pottery are uh, normally visible to us. And what we find in the transition from the Dark Age is that uh, we see uh, um, uh, decorations that uh, demonstrate both the, uh, the principles of the Dark Age, geometric uh, decorations, and representations of real-world events. Uh, these, uh, the decorations that uh, start to take place are still in a, in a very stylized way. They're not the more realistic representations of, of human forms um, that we find in, uh, uh, in archaic and classical uh, pottery. Uh, but, so these are stylized. Uh, these are... Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, um, you know, representative of uh, conceptual, and yet they also uh, commemorate uh, specific events that have actually happened. In this case, this is uh, clearly a funeral of an important person, uh, and we see both the you know the funeral, uh, um, you know, celebration on the upper tier, and a procession of warriors, uh, including uh, chariots and shields on the lower tier, uh, and these, uh, you know. It would indicate that this person was an important leader militarily, possibly somebody that we'd refer to as a, a you know, a, a dark age chief type, uh, you know, big man figure. Um, but uh, the the ways in which the um, uh, decoration is being used to uh, document history uh, is something that starts to come about at the end of the Dark Age and in the transition into the Archaic Period. Uh, this highlights one of the important things about the Archaic Period. The Archaic Period uh, values expression. It values the um, the not just the recording of knowledge, but the seeking of knowledge and the uh, the questioning of um, the world around us, the creation of new understanding and new ideas that comes from uh, uh, that comes from new forms of, 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 of artistic expression, uh, new forms of representation, uh, history, oratory, lyric poetry, and also um, th things like uh, uh, things like uh, uh, things like uh, uh, philosophy and science. Uh, one of the ways in which the, this expression is uh, represented in the archaic period is we have the emergence of the importance of the works of Hesiod. Hesiod is a, uh, a, a poet and a writer who uh, takes the opposite point of view from Homer. Uh, Homer is extremely important to Greek culture, uh, and Homer represents you know sort of the top-down approach the interaction of the uh, of the community collectively with the gods and uh, you know the, the sort of rules of society and the way in which people suffer when people violate rules and act selfishly uh, it it uh, deals with with heroes and people in the upper tier of society uh, and and behavior in a, in a sort of abstract um, 
and and uh, and and you know principled uh, sense. Uh, Hesiod uh, writes from the standpoint of a, of an ordinary farmer, uh, someone who owns a a a a perfectly you know ordinary estate, and writes about what it means to be a farmer and uh, what it means to live a good life. And the point of Hesiod is that uh, is that uh, you know that hard work. Uh, and responsibility are rewarded with a good life uh, and uh, the respect of the community and uh, the benevolence of the gods in a way that this is in contrast to you know being profligate being dissolute being selfish in a way that leads to sensuality and indulgence those things are bad those things you end up screwing yourself uh, but uh, hard work is worth pursuing for the the selfish end of ending up with uh, with prosperity and a good life and and a positive relationship with the community around you, so that they'll be there when uh, uh, when you need them and they know that they can count on you. Um, so the so the the sort of morals of Hesiod are extremely practical, extreme, extremely uh, salt of the earth, and you know represent a sort of bottom up approach to literature um, that uh, in the archaic period. Uh, um, you know, literature and self-expression, poetry tends to be more subjective and personal, uh, and uh, and rather than you know uh, grand and impersonal. Uh, and both Helmer and Hesiod uh, together, sort of uh, complementary in this way, both of them lay the foundations for all Greek culture to come. Uh, there are, you know, so there are uh, key components to the archaic period: uh, the polis, the emergence of the polis, uh, the emergence of the hoplite army, um, the uh, the prevalence of colonization, and uh, the idea of panhellenism. All these four things are the things that define the archaic period. The polis is the new form of the Greek uh, city-state that emerges out of the dark age. Uh, the polis is. Uh, um, is is a uniquely Greek form of the city state. So you see city states elsewhere in places like um, you know uh, in places like Sumer uh, and uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the you know and you know the amongst the Phoenicians uh, they have the city states. The Greek city state is uh, um, is distinctly Greek. Uh, as a center of identity, as a center of society, as a center of economy. Uh, it starts out with the, the basic fundamentals of a city-state, which is that it is uh, a city-state is characterized by you know, three things. It is economically self-sufficient, uh, it is politically autonomous, uh, and it has a patron deity. And uh, uh, so it is part of a city-state culture that shares a common history, a common language, and a common set of gods. And uh, so the relationship that it has with the other city-states is one of rivalry for local resources and, um, and uh, independence in, in identity. Uh, and uh, and the uh, the identification with uh, a particular god that is uh, invited to live amongst them and share their grace. This is the same kind of idea of city state that we've already seen in Sumer, uh, and uh, the 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 polis is based on this. Um, what to, what one of the things that makes the polis distinct is the way in which it forms. You remember that in the Dark Age, the uh, the people. Uh, at the beginning of the Dark Age, flee the cities and go out into the countryside. And for a long time, the uh, the, the basic, uh, you know, economic uh, structure is 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 essential agriculture, and people are living in farming villages that uh, um, the, that are you know not particularly centralized and that uh, are not particularly stratified in terms of class. Uh, the main thing that matters is whether you own property. And so, you know, the, 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 the flight to the countryside has a sort of leveling effect on class. Uh, what starts to happen over the course of the Dark Age is that uh, these farming villages merge together. And they merge together around a central marketplace, a large open space that becomes a common marketplace for all the territories around. Uh, this is called the Agora, and the Agora becomes a, you know, not just the commercial center of the surrounding territory, but the social center as well. And it becomes a hub. It becomes a, a you know, a, a centrifugal 
uh, uh, you know, center that uh, comes to be the, 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 the place where not just commerce, but social interaction and cultural development takes place. The agora is the beating heart of the, uh, of the community, and it's around the agora that these, uh, the, these, uh, all these communities merge together and, and form a central identity. And so Sinoicism is the, is the process of this merging, and it is also the process where local identity is replaced with the central identity, uh, an identity that's focused on, on the city uh, and not just the, the local communities, not just your uh, um, connections with your, uh, with your family and clan and, and, and in the vicinity of, of where your ancestors have already been. And, and this is the, the key hurdle that must be overcome, this replacement of identity. Uh, the story of the emergence of the polis and the formation of a strong polis in particular is the story of the breaking down of local identity and replacing it with central identity. Um, one of the ways in which this occurs is uh, um, the, uh, a, a shared sense of political involvement. Uh, and um, the, one of the, th the ways in which this, uh, you know, um, uh, plays out is that by the beginning of the archaic period, the kings uh, are uh, have have gone away. Uh, the Basileus, the uh, you know the local big man, has been dispensed with, and when the polis emerges, it, it emerges without a king. Instead, uh, the polis has elected magistrates that generally serve for one year, and this is a key characteristic. Uh, the problem is that uh, the replacement for the Basileus is uh, a, you end up with a, a dynamic tension, a, a, a strong conflict between the nobility, who uh, uh, are referred to as the Aristoi. The Aristoi is a Greek word that means the best. Um, the, uh, the nobility feel that they are the best uh, for the guiding of the community and, and leadership uh, and this is in contrast to the citizen assembly, the demos, the people, uh, the, the, the many. The demos feels that they have a right to have a say in uh, uh, and that they have the right to essentially be sovereign, to make the decisions for their community. And so on the one hand, you have the few that feels entitled because of the prominence of their families, because of blood going back centuries, uh, because of uh, the wealth that gives them a greater stake and more to lose, more to defend. The Aristoi feel that they have a right to make decisions. The people, uh, having gained uh, uh, control of their community away from the big men, uh, feel that they have a right um, to make decisions based on themselves. The thing that drives the polis forward is this dynamic tension between the demos and the Aristoi, between the, the many and the few. And this is the, the things that to, the, to change, the things that take place during the archaic and the classical era are the things that, that come about as a result of friction between the demos and the Aristoi. Um, uh, one of the ways in which the, uh, the, the nobility feels uh, responsible for the community, feels uh, that uh, they have a responsibility to contribute is culturally um, towards uh, self-expression. And so one of the things that's characteristic about the polis is, uh, is regular gatherings amongst the nobility in order to patronize the arts, in order to hear performances of poetry uh, and, uh, you know, readings of, 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 of new uh, works of scholarship and so forth. This is called the Symposium. And this is done in a, in a very relaxed setting, uh, you know, with a you know, performance of music and, and, uh, and so forth, uh, with a great deal of wine that takes place over the, great deal, uh, over the course of the night. Uh, there, you know, is a, sometimes a carnal element uh, underlying the proceedings, uh, but uh, this is um, a, the, one of the ways in which the nobles feel that uh, it is important for them to directly contribute to uh, the Greek culture and the fostering of, of new ideas, new expression, new understanding through the patronage of the arts. Uh, the hoplite army emerges as characteristic at the, uh, at the dawn of the archaic period. Uh, the hoplite army is made up of uh, 
uh, of all of the soldiers that can afford to purchase the equipment um, or who have it in their families. And so the Hoplite army is a, is a much broader uh, defensive force than, uh, than earlier in Greek history. Um, they're characterized by the large shield called the Hoplon, and the way in which they fight is to arrange themselves in a, in a phalanx, a, uh, a lineup of, of soldiers with uh, their shields overlapping. Um, that form a a, a massive uh, a battering ram of you know hundreds of, of men that are overlapping with each other uh, and and eight men deep behind and uh, the phalanx is is a uh, uh, is a huge advancement in warfare the the phalanx and, and the hoplite army becomes the the ultimate form of warfare in the ancient world. And the effect that it has on the Greek polis is to move the center of gravity uh, t away from the few and toward the many. War is no longer the purview of, of heroes at the top of society. With a, with a fighting like this, uh, um, it, it, oh, the, the, the hoplites are essentially entirely anomalous, uh, anonymous. You can't be a hero uh, in the, the line of the phalanx because everybody has to fight together. Everybody fights as this one cohesive line that only together can they crush the enemy. And so um, nobody stands out. Everybody fights together. The entire population um, that's fighting that day is empowered. Uh, and you know this uh, this has a this has a huge effect on warfare and on the uh, the empowerment of the of the demos in the in the Greek polis. Uh, so uh, with the uh, the the importance of the citizen body, this this involves a great deal of change uh, on behalf of the citizen body. This is one of the things that moves. Uh, Athens toward democracy, the, the total empowerment of the demos, the citizen body. It's important, therefore, to remember what is easy to forget, that there are other groups uh, within the polis that are not citizens. Uh, of course, the obvious uh, uh, group of this half of the, of the population is, is not citizens at all because they're female. Uh, once again, the, the, the male is understood to be responsible for the public world, the female for the private, and ideally these should be balanced and equally important. What we start to see in Greece uh, and particularly, especially in Athens, is the more the, the citizen becomes empowered, the more the public world starts to take over. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ability of women to involve themselves in society is reduced as a result. So, ironically, the most uh, 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 citizen-empowered state in the ancient world uh, is the one that uh, empowers men at the ex exclusion of women. Uh, another population very important in Greek cities, especially commercial cities like Athens and Corinth, is the medic, <coughs> medic the, uh, the resident alien uh, who uh, may be very powerful and important and influential in commercial terms uh, and might you know, own important uh, you know, factories or mines or whatever outside of the city, but because they're not citizens, uh, they cannot be... Um, you know, because they're not native, they cannot be citizens, and so they can't be um, uh, involved. And, and medics can be other Greeks from, you know, somebody from Thebes living in Athens, or they could be, you know, foreigners, somebody who's, you know, of Persian extraction who is doing business in, uh, in the Greek city. Uh, like I said, medics can be important and influential behind the scenes. They just can't uh, participate in the political process. And then there are the servile classes, uh, in Sparta, this is the helots, the serfs. Uh, in the rest of the Greek world, especially Athens, you find uh, that there are slave populations. Most of the slaves in Athens are domestic slaves that are there to demonstrate the importance of a, of a, of a house and a family. Um, and so, uh, generally speaking, have things relatively good. Uh, but slave populations also include people that are working the mines and uh, therefore have a, uh, have a very difficult life and a very high mortality. Uh, the other thing that characterizes the archaic period is colonization. Colonization takes place because uh, um, uh, that uh, population grows so much during the Dark Age and, they, and into the archaic period that the um, only moderately fertile lands of the Greek mainland and the Aegean islands are uh, are, are not uh, suited to support 
uh, uh, the growing populations. And so colonization is a, a means of exporting chunks of your population in order to establish new cities elsewhere. Um, these new cities, these colonies also serve to uh, um, expand to, uh, the access that the Greeks have to natural resources for use in commerce and markets for Greek goods. And so uh, colonies are very important economically. Um, the, the other thing about Greek colonies is that the Greek colony is created only by one particular polis. And so each uh, colony is a child of one particular polis, is, is connected to its mother city. The mother city has a uh, has a right to uh, uh, intervene uh, when the when the colony is is undergoing a severe crisis or a civil war or something like that. Um, but beyond that, the the colony becomes a, a new and independent uh, polis uh, that is contributing to the economy of the Greek world and has a special trade relationship with its mother city. Uh, the other thing about the colonies is that they remain connected to the Greek world culturally, even if they are a great distance from home, because there is regular interaction. The colony keeps up with uh, changes in artistic expression and uh, in all of the other aspects of Greek society and culture back in the Aegean. And so, for example, we see here uh, at uh, the Greek colony Persepolis on the uh, northern coast of Africa that uh, in the background there's a, a temple that was built in the 6th century and that reflects 6th century architectural styles and then in the foreground there's a temple that was built in the 5th century and represents 5th century architectural styles. The, uh, um, the, uh, the, the colonies are an integral part of Hellas, of the, of the Greek community and uh, the, the interaction and contributions go back and forth. The whole of Hellas, including the hundreds of polis back in the Aegean and the hundreds of colonies around the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the whole of Hellas, including the polis at home and the colonies, is, is thriving interactive uh, uh, culture. And this is one of the things that helps to reinforce Panhellenism, the idea of, um, you know, while each of the polis are in rivalry with each other, they also, you know, understand the value of their, of their collective culture, reinforcing the, um, the pursuit of the ideal society. Uh, and to do so through competition. And so the representation of this is the Olympics, which begins right at the dawn of the Archaic period in, uh, uh, in, in the 770s. Uh, you know, the, the Olympics represent the way in which the Greeks pursue the ideal culture through competition with each other. And uh, uh, and uh, this being this rivalry, this competition being beneficial uh, of to to everybody involved, uh, um, allowing them to to all be driven and pushed toward uh, being the best that they can possibly be. And uh, we'll see some of the effects of that as we continue. But for now, that's that.